Good morning, students. And uh, today I want to um, discuss this question paper. And it is multiple choice question. So let's get started. And this is IGCSE Biology 0610. Question number one. Which characteristic of a living organism is described by the following definition? The ability to detect changes in the environment and make responses. So the first option is excretion. I just review the definition of the excretion in my mind. The excretion is the um, removal of the metabolism based products like carbon dioxide, water, and also urea. Either through the skin, through the um, urinary system, or on kidneys, or it can be through your lungs. So, this is this has actually nothing to do with being to this actually description. The other one is movement. Movement is changing position to displace from one place to another part. So, it again, has nothing to do detect the changes in the environment around us. Respiration is a chemical reaction that happens in every individual cell to break the food by using the oxygen and to release the energy between the bones of the chemical bone of the food. So, it has, again, nothing to do with this one, with this uh, sentence. And... Part D is sensitivity. Yes, sensitivity. We have different senses. We have touch, we have sight, taste, uh, hearing. So all of them, uh, and also all, all of these senses, they help us to detect any kind of the changes around us in the surrounding. And based on that, to... Uh, escape or to uh, save our life, to uh, protect ourselves from any kind of the danger. So we detect danger, um, any source of the danger around us, based on, based on that we make a proper response, either to fight or to, uh, to run away or to um, do some kind of something with the secreted like when you see a delicious food your uh, saliva will be actually secreted. So it's another kind of the response. Um, so answer is D. Question number two, what is the correct order of arthropod group from those with most legs to those with fewest legs? So please read always correctly. It is from the most legs to fewest. So this should be most and then adds to the least. Some of the uh, students don't look at this, actually. These keys are argument to them. This is very important. Sometimes they think, they just think that, okay, I'm just following the order. It can but they write it from the least to the highest, but we do not want that. It says from the least or the most, sorry, from the most legs, the fewest. So, um, Based on the information, insects, they have three pairs or six legs. Uh, arachnids, they have four pairs or eight legs. Crustaceans, that have ten legs, five pairs. And myriapods, they have, as it says, hundreds or thousands of the legs or pairs of the legs. So, based on the definition, D should be the answer because this is the highest number of the legs it has and insects they have the least. Question number three, which animal is an analyte? 
so you need to just follow the instruction given to you, the key which is given to your identification key. So we'll start with the first part of this identification key. You need to read each of these sentences and see which one of them is correct, and then you just follow the instruction given after the dot, after the dotted line. It has a legs. Do you analyze? They have led legs. So if the answer is correct, you can have to go to two. If they don't have, you should go to three. Which one is correct? They don't have any legs because they are they look like worms. They have a worm-like structure as they are. Uh, so the worms they don't have legs. I just want to show a photo of analytes if I can. That's the earthworm is one of the examples. These are analytes. It's an example of the analyte I can see it has a segmented body. Do you see these segments? There are different sections or different parts it has. So lots of lines are called the segments. So it has a segmented body. And do you see any legs? Of course, it doesn't have any leg. So that's another feature of the analytes. Now on this question paper, we one more time want to uh, look into it. So we found out that it doesn't have any legs. So we have to continue by reading the uh, instruction three. So I just skip two and go directly to three. The third one has, says has a shell. So if it has a shell, it means that it is, the name is organism C, for example. So, and it has no shell, you should call it as organism D. Did you see any shell? No, it's a soft body. It doesn't have any shell. So the answer it is, has no shell. So the answer should be organism D. Well, we go to question number four. Root hair cells are formed on plant roots. Which feature would be present in a root hair cell but not in a uh, but not a sperm cell? So this is first of all when they say this root hair cell is an actual example of a plant cell. Sperm cell is an example of an animal cell. So it means that we want to compare plant cell with the animal cell. Now I read the question one more time. Which feature would be present in a plant cell but not in an animal cell? Is it easier now? It should be easier. So I can now answer. What can you see in a plant cell you do not see in the, plant cell, in the animal cell? Is it cell membrane? No, both of them, they have a cell membrane. Is it the cell wall? Yes. Sperm cell or is an example of the animal cell. The animal cell, they don't have a cell wall. It's only a plant cell that has a cellulose cell wall. Chloroplast. Chloroplast, you may say that you can find in a plant cell. And, uh, so how about this? Is it the correct answer? No, because this is a plant cell, yes. But it is under the ground, and because they're under the ground, there is no sunlight, definitely, because the plant, the plant cell here, as a root has said, doesn't need to do photosynthesis, so it doesn't have any chloroplasts, so hence, no chlorophylls. So it means that none of these two, no, no root has said, neither sperm cells, they don't have any chloroplasts. So this is also wrong. It's not the answer. So how about cytoplasm? Both of them, animal cell and the plant cell, they have cytoplasm. So the answer is B. Question number five. Which structure is found in a palisade cell but not in a liver cell? Palisade cell is an example of the plant cell. 
liver cells, an example of the animal cells, because the liver can be found in one of the organs in the uh, animal body. But of course, plants, they don't have any liver. So now I read again the question, which structure is found in a plant cell, but not in an animal cell? Cell membrane, both of them they have. Central vacuole, yes, um, actually palisade cells, which is up in the plant cell, they have a central vacuole, is a permanent central vacuole. And I told you, usually, animal cells don't have any vacuole, and if they have, it's not permanent. Cytoplasm can be found in both of them, and the nucleus can be found in both of them. So the answer is B. Please read the question correctly. Even it is it is, it, is, it is bold here. It means that it's written in a bold color. You see that it's darker color. It means that you have to pay attention to this. What is it you can find in a plant cell but not in an animal cell? If you just do not get this one, you do not see this one, you do not notice, which is it doesn't have, then you may give a wrong answer and become confused. Question number six, which cell shows the position of the nucleus correctly? So let's see again. So let's review. So this is a plant cell. And around it, the, actually the external wall is called as a cell wall. Then after that, this second layer is cell membrane. Then this part, which is a grayish color and has some darkest spot and that is a cytoplasm, that liquid that all other or organelles are actually floating in it. Then after that should be a nucleus. Before I turn to the nucleus, what is this gap here? This bubble, which is filled with some water and liquid, is a cell sap, which is a vacuole and has a cell sap in it. So you cannot find nucleus inside this. It is surrounded by the cell membrane. It is surrounded by the membrane. Usually, nucleus, which contains DNA, is placed in the cytoplasm. So the answer is B. This is wrong because it's showing this cell nucleus between cell membrane and the cell wall, which is totally wrong. This is inside the vacuole, and this one is inside the vacuole. Both of them also wrong so the answer is b then i go to question number seven what are the levels of the organization of the walls of the villus the small intestine you know that a small intestine is this diagram i show you this is inside your small intestine you can see there are lots of finger and light projections there which is called as a v-line and one of them is called as a Villus. I just want to show you the structure of this one of these actually be like. So if we make it magnified under the microscope, that what you see usually in it. I just pick one of these photos. I think this is good. So on each of these, this is one villus, one of these finger-like projections inside the uh, lining or the wall of the small intestine and actually it is folded a lot of finger like structures that actually increase the surface area of your small intestine the inside of the lumen and helps to for the faster absorption of the nutrients inside your bloodstream under this each villus is lots of capillaries blood capillaries very tiny uh, thin, actually, the thinnest uh, blood vessels. So, from one side, you can see the red color is carrying the oxygenated and empty of the nutrients, actually, blood into the villus. And once it actually moves under this villus, it the nutrients will all absorbed into it. So, when it leaves and goes out into the blue color, it has lots of uh, nutrients which is absorbed into it. So it carries away from it. Now, the inside, the, in the middle of this villus, there is another structure. This is called, this is not actually one part of your lymphatic system, 
which is called as a lacteo. Lacteo is actually where the uh, fatty acid and the glycerols, the glycerol, it is absorbed into it from the lumen. Um, you know that the, the fat and oil are, um, and also are those things that are being digested inside your alimentary canal, and um, usually by the uh, lipase, one of the enzymes called as lipase. So lipase breaks down the lipid or fat molecules and oil into its ingredients, it's what they are being made of. Usually the fats are being made of uh, glycerol and the fat, two fatty acids, and uh, the fatty acids. So now they are very small and tiny, so we can easily uh, diffuse um, out of the out of the small intestine, and it can go into the. Uh, but instead of going into the capillaries, they go into the lacteal and they will carry out of the villus to be sent to the cells to be used. So based on that definition, now what are the levels of the organization of the villus? Villus is a kind of a group of actually similar cells. Villus is a group of the similar cells and they are uh, working together to perform one job, which is a better absorption of the uh, nutrients. So that's a tissue, this is the definition of a tissue, and small intestine is an organ, an organ, this organ is one actually organ from the, uh, that it is working with the other organs, it belongs to one system, the whole system which is called as a uh, digestive system. So the digestive system is consists of different organs and tissues, and one of them is a small intestine. So the answer should be C, tissue and organ. Eight, phloem is an example of a cell, a tissue, an organ, or an organ system. So when we move on into the, from A to D, this level of organization actually is becoming bigger. So it's very, a cell is a very the basic unit, the unit of uh, any uh, living organisms. So what is this being made of? And they come in a different shape and a specific shape, in the, in the shapes, features, and different things. So well, phloem is a group of the cells that are similar and they work together to perform again uh, for a job, one purpose. So the purpose is that to carry whatever is being made in the leaf called as translocation, translocating the sucrose and amino acids everywhere into the plants because they're going to use it later for growth, repair, and everything. So it's not a cell, it's a group of the cell. The group of the cell which are similar, so the answer is a tissue. So phloem is an example of a tissue. It is not an organ because the organ is made of different tissues that they work to, similar tissues that work together now to, 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 to for the same purpose, but it's not also an organ system. Answer is B. Now we go to question number nine. The diagram shows the fetus attached by the placenta to the uterus wall of the mother. By which process do all substances pass between the fetus and the mother in the placenta. Okay. The first one. You know that inside the placenta there are lots of capillaries again. The blood of the mother and the fetus do not mix together. There are just the blood go there. And because there are lots of capillaries and there is only one cell thick between them, a distance between them is very short. So it's easier for and faster for the nutrients to travel through these two tissues between this mother and the fetus. So this is caused the faster and better diffusion of the material on the nutrients between the mother and also fetus. So it is what we are, the exchange of matter here is by diffusion. 
and it's not a nutrition it doesn't have to do anything with nutrition nutrition is is taken by the mouth or something it's not a nutrition osmosis is not an osmosis osmosis is a travel of movement of the water molecule through the partially permeable membrane from vertical or higher in concentration to vertical vertical or lower in concentration so this cannot be because we are talking about um, substances the solutes so those particles can be food particles it can be any nutrients so the fusion is just simply the movement of the particles of the solute or can be in substances from where there are more concentration to where there are lower in concentration. So this is the definition of the diffusion. So till now, I is correct. A is the answer. Respiration it has nothing to do with this. Respiration, as I told you, is a chemical reaction that happens in individual cell in the mitochondria of them to when the food mixes, uh, actually reacts with the oxygen and then uh, during this reaction, uh, the bound between the chemical, actually uh, bound between these uh, food molecule is broken down and it's through which a huge amount of energy will be released in the form of the ATP for the uh, cells to use. So the answer here is A. Question number 10, what happens in osmosis? So I just uh, give you the definition. In the osmosis, always there should be partially permeable membrane or a cell membrane. Wherever there is, so it means that there is an osmosis. And also, is only water. During the osmosis, water actually passes through the partially permeable membrane, not solutes, not, not gases, not nutrients. It's a water molecule. But how do they move down the concentration gradient? It means from where there are more in concentration to where there are less in concentration. When do you have higher concentration of the water? When the solution is dilute. It means that there are lots of water molecule, but a small amount of the solute. But when do you have the lower concentration of the water molecules? When there are less water but too much solute it means that the uh, solution is very concentrated it can be salt solution it can be sugar solution it can be syrup okay so based on this movement of the solute molecules against the concentration gradient it's not against the concentration gradient and it's not the solute it's not the solute movement. I told you in the osmosis water molecule they move. So I just skip A and B and go directly to C and B. Either C or D is the answer. Movement of the water molecules against the concentration gradient. It means that from against means that usually normally water. If it is, imagine that there is a cascade of the water. So water always comes from the high level to low. Never goes up the hill. So it's exactly when we say the water is going against the uh, that concentration it means that so it's going from down to up so that is wrong so for that purpose you need to install a pump to just send the water uh, from the lower actually level to the higher level so but here or energy should be used but here there is no actually energy being used in the diffusion uh, so in the, the diffusion and osmosis, there is no actual energy being used for that purpose because it's simply going down the concentration gradient from where they are higher to where they are lower. So it's a movement of the water molecules down the concentration gradient. D is the answer of this question. Question number 11. A human digestive system breaks down its sort of straight at a fast rate at 35 Celsius. What would occur if the enzyme and substrate were kept at 75 Celsius? Then it actually says that um, it's the fast rate of its enzyme activity is at this temperature, 35. It means that this is the optimum temperature. 
what happens in the optimum temperature, it means that before and after that, the enzyme actually doesn't work that much properly. So the actually the temperature when it slightly decreases or increases can have effect on the enzyme activity. I want to show again one more time the enzyme activity and temperature actually diagram. Okay, I think this is a really good diagram. Here, if you look at this graph, it's showing you the range of the enzyme activity, which is here, it's going up and through, it means that it is increasing. This is zero activity, and the activity increases up to anything. The other one is showing the temperature. It starts from zero, maybe to higher, higher temperatures. Each enzyme has its own different, actually, optimum temperature. For example, our body enzymes work actually the best in, for example, 37.5, okay? And other enzymes are different. This enzyme that I'm telling you, I did give an, as an example, they say it works best as 35. It means that this is very, actually, it looks, this is 35 for it. 35 Celsius should be here because at this point, the enzyme has its highest rate of activity. Highest rate. It means that it, if the te you increase the, the temperature or it becomes lower than this temperature, this activity cannot go beyond this point. If you, can, if you go below this temperature, as I said, it becomes inactive, the enzyme. Sometimes it becomes, the rate of reaction becomes very slow, it goes down, but it becomes inactive. But if you go beyond this point, I mean, go to increase the temperature, as it says, like 75 and something. So what is happening here? You see that this, there is a very sharp downward actually trend. It shows that the enzyme suddenly has become, is not working anymore. So it means that the temperature has actually changed the, the shape of that active side that the substrate should be placed on. So the substrate cannot be placed into it anymore. So the enzyme has lost its active shape size. And we call it as being denatured. So enzyme here is becoming denatured. So it can't actually be used anymore. So it become totally uh, deformed or denatured. Okay, so if you increase or beyond this actual temperature, what is happening to the enzyme, it becomes denatured because the shape of that part of the enzyme that should be connected and joined and binded to the um, substrate, actually this will be changed so it doesn't work anymore. Now let's get back to question. Now the enzyme, the first part says that enzyme would stop working and be denatured. This is correct. Based on whatever I tell you, A is the answer. The rest of them are wrong because the reaction would continue at the same rate. No, never. The reaction would take place more quickly. No. If it becomes so, I said this is the uh, optimum temperature. It means that it doesn't matter. The, if you increase temperature, it won't go. The reaction rate won't become more than this anymore. This is for this enzyme, this is the fastest rate of reaction. Uh, the reaction would take place more quickly. No, the reaction would take place more slowly. Again, no. Actually, totally becomes the nature stops working. So answer is A. Question number 12, the diagram shows the action of amylase. What is the function of the enzyme amylase? So, as you can see, amylase is a part of a starch molecule, and this is enzyme that is acting on each the bond between these molecules. Starch molecule is the mainly actually glucose molecule joined together, linked together. This is one glucose, one glucose, one glucose, one glucose. Okay. And when actually amylase works on it, what happens? First, breaks the bound between each two molecule. It means that it cannot make it like a single glucose molecule first. So, when you put amylase on it, amylase is able to break each uh, the that 
chain into uh, like two glucose molecules, like a, like a small uh, chains part, a small part that each chain now contains only two glucose molecules. This is called as is it called as a maltose because maltose is made of glucose and glucose, it's two glucose molecules joined together. Now. So it means that when you amylase, uh, you put amylase in the starch, so the starch is broken down into maltose, which is consists of two glucose molecules. Then later on, another digestion will happen into your small intestine that the maltase comes. Maltase is an enzyme that breaks down the maltose molecule in, and make it smaller into smaller glucose molecules now that can be absorbed through the uh, lumen of your small intestine. So what is the function of the enzyme amylase? Break down the substrate into amino acid? No, amino acids are building blocks of protein. Proteins are a reputation of the amino acid sequences of amino acids. Changes the product into substrate? No, uh, it is wrong. We can't say that because usually that's the substrate that is actually broken down into the product and forms product. Substrate joins with the enzyme and forms product. The product can be anything. Increases the rate of starch breaking down into glucose? No. No. Increase the rate of starch? Increases the rate of the starch uh, breaking down into maltose. Yes, as I told you, uh, maltose uh, amylase is to break down starch into maltose, and then mal maltose is broken down by maltase into two glucose molecules. So the answer is D. Question number 13, which is an incisor tooth. In the, to in the teeth structures and the types of the teeth, I just want to show to you the diagram again. This is the diagram of uh, two different tooth types in your uh, upper and lower jaw. Um, you can see that these two because they are exactly the same, uh, it's like a symmetrical on the both side and also on the upper jaw and the lower jaw are all the same two types are repeated, uh, two patterns. So these are the central incisors, or there are one, two, and there are uh, another two here. So in each jaw, we have four incisors. Incisor teeth, actually teeth, are quite flat in shape. And if you remember, I just um, imagine the scissor. The scissor is very sharp and uh, so you can cut the paper and everything, but that is it. So it exactly is the same for the incisors. Incisors are sharp, but they are flat and they can cut and uh, the pieces of the food. For the canine, canine as maybe you have heard of all the cats and dogs that are called as canine. So these are actually very sharp and pointed teeth that are used for tearing uh, apart the flesh of the pre prey. So if I want to show you in the, we have it, but it's not too sharp, but in the other animals that are hunters, like the dogs and tiger, now you can see these uh, teeth are very sharp and pointed. These are the canine teeth. This is in a case of any other animals. They got a very sharp, actually, teeth. Yeah, the canine in the animals are very sharp and long. These ones you can see in the dogs also. But in the human being, it's not that much sharp anymore. Can you see that? It's like a bit pointed, a bit pointed. They are useful to tear the praise. 
again on this diagram after that we have premolar and then we got molar so premolar are only two and here three so over all in the upper jaw we got four uh, premolar and the molar becomes six so it means in the lower jaw again we have the same number of the molar premolar canine and scissors now let us get back to the question one more time so based on this diagram now you see the information you should know that these flattened actually but sharp uh, teeth in front or in scissors they are like scissor actually they cut they use for cutting and see which is pointed and sharp should be in season it should be canine it is like the other animals that they have pointed and sharp just tearing the flesh and uh, the other ones are premolar a and d is molar because they are for chewing and crushing so answer is b question number 14 small molecules are used as the basic units in the synthesis of large fit molecules which statement is correct so um amino acids are basic units of carbohydrates carbohydrates like sugar like a starch chocolate anything they call they have carbohydrates and the carbohydrates are actually uh, made of a small glucose molecule um there are sugars so they they are not made of actually uh, amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Fatty acids are basic units of the glycogen. Glycogen is a very big, complex, and insoluble form of uh, sugar. It's a uh, sugar molecule. So um, whenever your body wants to store sugar and remove it, excess sugar from your blood, store it in the form of the glycogen inside your muscles or in the liver. And here, fatty acids are, so glycogen, as it is sugar, so it's made of the simple sugar molecules like glucose, but fatty acids are actually used to make a fat molecule or to make lipid so actually i have no relationship between these two so a and b totally wrong c glycerol is a basic unit of the oil okay um oils fats lipids they are made of fatty acids and glycerol so there is a one glycerol molecule rounded shape in the head and fatty acid molecules attached to it as a tail. So, yes, it is correct, is a basic unit of the oil. This simple sugar is a basic unit of protein. No, protein, again, are made of amino acids. Amino acids, they assemble together one next, another, next to another one, attached together to make a chain of amino acids that make protein. But it is not made of a, it's not a sugar to be made of a simple sugar. So D is also wrong. So answer is C. Question number 15. The roots of plants take up nitrates from the soil. What are the nitrates used to make? This is also very important. So I need to explain first the structure again one more time of the protein to make this clear for you. Look at this diagram. This figure shows that the amino acids are joined together to make a protein chain. And in, in, in our digestive system, because the protein is a very huge, big molecule, so it needs first to be uh, actually uh, broken down into amino acids that are quite smaller so that they can pass through the uh, intestine, intestinal wall and then get into the bloodstream and then be carried out to the cells. Otherwise, the protein is very big and it cannot pass through the uh, intestine. 
So that's what actually is happening. So you see that the protein are made of the small, small molecules of the amino acids. And amino acids, actually, there are 20 of them in the whole nature. And the combination of them, the sequences of them are a bit different in each of the proteins. Why protein are so important? Because there are many structures in our cells, in our body, that are actually being made of by protein. So like, for example, enzymes are made up of proteins. They are proteins. And hormones are proteins. Antibodies are proteins. And cell membrane has protein inside it. And there are many things that are based on the protein molecules, so they're all made up of them. Now look at into another diagram. If I want, if I want to know why actually uh, you're talking about amino acids, amino acids themselves are these are small molecules. This is the structure of them, the chemical structure. You don't need to know it. Just I want to show you that there is one nitrogen in it. That's why they are, this is called as amino group. That's why they're called as amino acids. There is one amino group in it. There is one carboxyl group in it. So that's why there are amino acid. Actually, this molecule is called as amino acid. So we know that amino acids, they contain nitrogen in their structure. That's why nitrogen molecule is also very vital, very important for the cell, for the body, we need to have this nitrogen included in our, actually in the foods because, and the nutrients and the minerals. Why? Because we need to make proteins. We need to make amino acids and amino acids are used to make proteins and the proteins are actually reformed, reshaped to make enzymes, antibodies, and proteins that are embedded inside the cell membrane uh, and many other things. Okay, so this is the structure of the amino acid that you see that there is one nitrogen molecule in it. Okay, now we go back to paper, and now it is asking that we were question for 15. Um, the root of the plant takes up nitrates from the soil. What are the nitrates used to make? They are used to make now we know. Amino acid and amino acid are made to uh, are used to make protein. So we don't have amino acid, we have protein. So C is the correct answer. Fat molecule is made of the glycerol and fatty acids. Glucose is made is a simple molecule, and starch is made of the small simple sugar molecules. Question number 16, the dietary fiber passes through several structures after leaving the stomach. In which order does the dietary fiber pass through these structures? Now, I have to find the order uh, of dif different organs that are joined together. Once, so the passage of the food um, once it goes out of the stomach, I just show on the diagram very fast. So the, the food actually is taken through the mouth, it's by the mouth, and it goes into the esophagus. And through that, it goes into the stomach. Now, the question is that after that, we need to know through which structure it passes through. In your book, you don't have, in the syllabus, you don't have jejunum. So... In the syllabus, it's omitted. You only need to study about the genome and ileum. So the food after that, when it leaves the stomach, it goes to the genome, and then it goes to ileum. We remove this word. It goes to ileum. And after that, it connects to the large intestine, and then it is colon, and then it is rectum. Rectum is the last part, is where the feces are being temporarily stored there. So I go back to the question one more time. So here, the answer should be, first, we said after it leaves, it goes to the genome. So the answer either is A or B. So C and D is totally wrong. I don't look at them anymore. So either A or B, let's see which one is correct. So jejunum and ileum, now both of them are the same, and this one, they are similar. So which one is different? So 
uh, I know that that food will after ileum, it leaves the ileum and it turns into the colon and the rectum is the last part. So A is the answer. Question number 17. In what form does a plant absorb and lose water? When the plant absorbs water, it is absorbed through the roots, by the roots from the soil. The water that you can find in the soil is in the form of the liquid. So either the answer is A or is B. C and D is totally wrong. Now I continue with the rest of the question. And in what form it loses water? It loses water through the leaves and stomata, the holes that are under the leaf. So they evaporate. They should change into gas so that they can move out of the plant through this, to diffuse out of the plant. So it is in form of the gas or water vapor. So the answer B is correct. We move on. Question number 18. The diagram shows a plant shoot and the stem, the same shoot, six hours later. Which change in environmental conditions could cause this change in the appearance of the shoot? You can see that the plant is wilted. You see that the shape of the uh, leaves are not that much actually firm, standing on the stem, and they are actually drooping. So I should know that the water actually it has lost the water. This is my actually prediction. So a decrease in available water. One of the answer is this. The, the other one. So if the water is decreased, of course, when there is less water available, the water, the plant cells, they become wilted because they lose water. They have less water available. So the plant shrink, it becomes flaxed. So this is correct, but I just want to move on to the other uh, options too to see why they are wrong. It decreases in the light intensity. If you increase the light intensity, not necessarily we get this a decrease in the light in intensity. It means that you have less light, so there will be less evaporation. If there, there is less water actually lost uh, by, in, in the plant, so it means that this should not happen. The plant shouldn't become flaxed because the evaporation is decreased, evaporation rate. So less water is being lost by the plant. And in a, a decreased wind speed, if the wind speed in decreases, the evaporation rate also decreases. I mean, less water will be lost by the plant. If the wind speed increases, of course, we will be more evaporation, so the plant definitely become flaxseed or wilted. But here, it is decreasing the wind speed, so less evaporation, so hence, uh, plant, of course, won't actually be affected like this and uh, the part they say is an increase in humidity the more the humidity it means that because the air it becomes saturated by the water molecule it cannot accept any more uh, water vapor which is so it means that the more humid the weather the slower would be the evaporation the slower the evaporation of course it means that the plant won't actually lose that much water so it won't become wilted so these are wrong because of that. But that's the only water availability. If it decreases, I mean, you give less water to plant and there is less um, access to the water by the plant. It means that it loses water and also it becomes wilted. So answer is A. 19. And an experiment is set up to investigate the uptake of oxygen by germinating seeds. What happens to the levels at X and Y? So we look at uh, X and Y. It is a colored water. Both of them there are water in it. There is a water bath. The temperature is adjusted. It's quite normal. There are germinating seeds in it. Um, there are uh, dead seeds. And also soda lime absorbs carbon dioxide. This in this one in Y. 
if the soda lime is absorbing carbon dioxide, in the germination, they see the respire. So they need oxygen and they need light. They need right temperature. The temperature, right temperature, which is 25, is given to all of them. But the problem is that they, on, the, on the right test tube, the seeds are dead. But the other one in the left side, they are germinating. Okay. So in the Y, there should not be any changes because the seeds are dead. They can't germinate. They can't do anything. So there are already, so the Y actually stays unchanged. And I can't go actually under any kind of anaerobic, you know, respiration or anything there because there is also that soda line that absorbs carbon dioxide. Well, we go to the left side. Uh, in the left side, we have the right temperature. We have the seeds that are germinating. And so we have to see what is happening here. And this test tube now... Um, because the oxygen inside the test tube, because the, the top of the test tube is sealed, is actually by the bunk. And uh, so it just, there is a, a bit of oxygen also left inside this delivery tube in, in the upper part. So the seed has started using and consuming all this oxygen which is inside the test tube for germination. Once this happens, because there would be less air inside the test tube, so the water will replace the air. So it means that the X actually rises up the, it goes up to the uh, tube. So the answer is that the X go up the tube, rises, and the Y stays unchanged because the seeds are already dead. So the answer is D. Question number 20, which group contains substances that are all carried in the blood? In the blood, if the substances are carried in the blood, it means that they should be small enough and should be light, small. And so, for example, there should be very simple molecules, substances, something that can be dissolved or it can be actually be inside the blood. So one of them are uh, smaller, actually, nutrients or building blood, the basic units of any kind of the macromolecules. We can't find fat. We can't find oil or, or any lipid in it because there are huge, there are big macromolecules. We can't find proteins because they are quite big. Uh, we can't find any... Uh, like cholesterol, like we can't find any kind of like um, cellulose because it's a very big sugar molecule and also insoluble. We can't, and there is also cellulose usually for belongs to the plants. It just cannot find it in it. Uh, and also if you find it, uh, it should get just broken into a simple molecule of the sugar. And glycogen is a very big sugar molecule. It is insoluble. Starch is a very big sugar molecule. It is insoluble. And they can't, they cannot actually pass through the cell membrane and go inside the bloodstream. So what you find there is a small tiny molecules like amino acids that are in that they make actually proteins, well, the amino acids, small molecules that they can be in the blood. After the food is digested, they can find amino acids in the blood. You can find any kind of the gases in it, like carbon dioxide, of course, can be dissolved in it. Oxygen can be found in it, uh, any kind of these gases. Salts can be found in it. Urea is a very uh, small chemical molecule. Hormones can be found in the blood not testosterone, estrogen, or uh, progesterone. Um, you can find lactic acid is a very simple molecule. And these are all glucose you can find. Uh, so by looking at this information here, amino acid, carbon dioxide, okay, they can be found, but cellulose cannot be found. So A is rejected. 
B, glucose, yes. Glycogen, no, is a very big molecule of the sugar. And lactic acid, yes, but I can't accept B because of the glycogen. C, uh, estrogen and oxygen and a starch. Because of a starch, we cannot uh, accept C. So what is left is D, salt, testosterone, and urea are the molecules they can find in the blood. Answer is D. Question 21, which process does not release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere? So, um, you know that the composition of the animals, when the animals are decomposed, uh, there are carbon dioxide being produced during this reaction. So the composition of the dead matters, the litters, that causes uh, carbon dioxide to be released. Respiration are also the same because in the respiration, glucose is mixed with the oxygen and produces carbon dioxide, water, and uh, energy. So during the respiration, also we have carbon dioxide being produced. Respiration of the plants also the same, but what is different here is the photosynthesis of the plant. Photosynthesis is an in actually reversed uh, process of respiration. It means that if you reverse respiration, you will have photosynthesis. It means that when the water and carbon dioxide, uh, they mix together in the presence of the if I, uh, chlorophyll and the light, uh, it gives actually sugar or glucose molecule uh, to you and also um, a bit of oxygen. So here we don't have any production of the carbon dioxide, so answer is B. Question number 22, which mean, uh, materials are excreted by the kidneys and the lungs? By the kidneys, we have urea. That's the most important job of the kidney is to get rid of the urea. They change urea into urine so, and then excrete it. In the lungs, the carbon dioxide is being uh, excreted and diffused out. So answer is C. Question number 23, the graph shows the variation, make it a bit bigger, the graph shows the variation in a person's body temperature over a period of the time, which temperature change is likely to cause more sweating. Um, decrease in the body temperature, normal body temperature, and increase in the body temperature. You know that when you become feel hotter, um, during that process, in order for your body, during the homeostasis, is actually uh, try to adjust and regulate your body temperature and through which your, um, more, your, you will sweat more. And the sweat actually is the water which is going out of your body and a bit of salt and also urea. And when it sits on the surface of your skin, and when it evaporates, the evaporation is actually takes in heat or energy from your skin. So the water, then the water molecule gets an energy and they change from liquid into gas. So the, this is how they uh, remove heat from your body and cause cooling. They have a cooling effect. So the hotter the temperature. So here at this level, your body is very low in temperature, but here it increase, and after that it's top dropping. So it means that in this stage, in B, your body has uh, actually been more sweating. So that's why your body temperature after that has gone down again one more time. So answer is B. Question number 24, the diagram shows a germinating bean seed with a horizontal radical. This is placed on a slowly rotating disk and is left for three days. So it is horizontal, placed horizontally, and this is radical, and it is being said. So what is happening here is that which diagram shows the appearance of the radical after three days. Um, it, means, it says that at the beginning, um, um it's placed a slow rotating disc and left for three days. It means that the disc has been rotating there for three days. When it only starts rotating, the radical like becoming like confused. And 
So it just um, stays the same. I mean, if it had been, uh, because at the beginning, the seed radical had been horizontal when it was placed there. So when they actually started rotating this, the radical continued in the same pattern of the growth and the same direction because it, it, it just gets confused um, as the disk is rotating. So it cannot change. It doesn't change its direction and it stays the same. So C should be the answer. Which type of cell do all sense organs contain? Sense organs that are not ciliated, of course, the cilia are unlike hair-like structures um, that are projected from the cell membrane of the cells, just that are, can be found like in the respiratory system. Uh, an example of the ciliated cells can be found there, and they help to sweep off the mucus and bacterial or any unwanted material out of your respiratory system before they harm you. The B, effector. Effector um, is the one, uh, actually, that is, uh, can be like, for example, any kind of the muscles or can be uh, any kind of the glands. So these, they do not have, uh, which type of the cells do all sense organ contains. So actually, it has nothing to do with the uh, sense organs. And mesophyll, mesophyll cells is, can be found in the plants. Uh, spongy mesophyll cells are all the cells, rounded shape, spaced uh, apart from each other. There is a gap between them, and they help the ex easy exchange of the uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and oxygen in and out of the um, plant, uh, plant leaf. Receptor cells, all the cells, cell sense organs, they have receptors, of course, receptor cell. All the sense organs contain this kind of the cells, which is receptors, receptor cells. But not all of these uh, sense organs, for example, they contain, for example, like mesophyll or ciliated or effector. So the answer is receptor or D. Question number 26. The diagram shows the, uh, the early growth of a green plant. What is occurring here? I, mean, I have mitosis and development. We are comparing these two together. Um, in the plants, uh, which are growing here, yeah, is normal cell when they grow, they are growing and they are dividing and increasing in number by mitosis. So we have cell division, we have uh, here cell division happening, which is mitosis. And also is a kind of development also is happening here. Is actually is a growth and development, both of them together. So answer is A. Question number 27. This is a diagram of a neuron. Which structure could be found at X and Y? I mean, at this part, at these two ends, what should actually be put? What, how, to where they are connected to? This part of it and this part of it. X can be your skin because it is where the sensory actually cell or receptor cells are actually attached to this part. And then after that, this is the body of the neuron and then ended to Y. Y can be actually attached to a relay neuron or it can be, um, because we don't have a real neuron here, so it can be going to a spinal cord, because neuron also is placed in a spinal cord. So X can be a skin, spinal cord can be 
a spine a spinal cord can be placed at y so this is a is wrong b is wrong c also is wrong because if it goes to hand then it, it should be a motor neuron this is a sensory neuron this is an example of the sensory neuron no, not the motor neuron so that the answer is d Question number 28, the diagram shows a potato tuber that developed from the stem of parent potato plant. These shoots are starting to grow from the tube. This kind of the actual growth and reproduction is asexual reproduction because there are no two parents. There is one parent just budding and growing in one part, in a different part of it. How do the genotypes of the shoots compare with the genotype of the tube and of the parent? In the asexual reproduction, we want to shoot. This is the actually the other offspring of this parent. This is one parent, and this is its offspring, isn't it? So they are being produced by asexual production because there is no two parents. We don't have gametes. We have only one parent which has actually made exactly the similar, uh, this, uh, the offspring that they look exactly the same as the parent. So the answer should be the shoots are uh, identical to, uh, they are identical actually to each other. This shouldn't be actually different from the tuber and the parent because they are exact true copy of the parents because they have been developed from one parent. They are not two parents. And the shoots are identical to tuber. They are, they are different from the parent. No, they are exactly the same as the parent. In, the, in an asexual reproduction, we are, this is what is happening. The, the babies, they look exactly the same as the parent, one parent, because they are not parent. So they are different. No, they are identical. Yes. So answer is B. The C and D also are wrong. 29. The diagram shows the main reproductive system. What is the tube labeled X? I need to get back into the diagram one more time to explain it to you. So this diagram may be a bit different from that one, but not that much. So uh, this urata actually is the tube that coming directly from uh, your kidneys. So it connects to your kidneys. And after that, it brings the urine uh, towards the bladder and it stores it there. And once it wants to excrete the your own urinate, so the bladder sends it down this tube, which is called as a urethra, and it goes out. But the urination and this ejaculation of the sperms from the penis, they don't happen in the same time. So either this one or that one can't not be simultaneously happening. Then the other structure is a testicle. And then after that, the one that you will have here in the diagram is the prostate. And the other one, so the one that I'm showing by X on the diagram is ureta, is where the tube that brings the urine, which is formed in the kidneys, directly from the kidneys towards the bladder to store it there. I go back to the question. So, X should be here as ureta, and this is urethra. So we should not make the mistake, and this is the sperm duct, and rectum is here. This is rectum that you saw in the diagram. This is for ingestion or defecation, where the feces is going up, so it has nothing to do with this. Uh, structures and here this tube ureta connects to kidneys so x is c question number 30 which is not growth of an organism increase in dry mass of course growth means the mass of the uh, the body size increases the mass increases and number of the cells increases. So this is the meaning of the growth. 
but which, we, which one is not the meaning of the growth is swelling by absorbing water. If you see the cell is getting bigger just because it is more water in it, so it's swollen, it is quite hydrated, so it doesn't mean that it's growing. It's just swelling because the body mass is not changing. Number of the cells not changing. And this isn't a permanent increase in the size, no. It just temporarily, once it loses water, it will actually decrease and shrink in size. So that's why D is not, it is D is the answer because it's not the definition of the growth. It doesn't mean it is growth. 31, what are the chromosomes for the two sexes in human beings? Chromosomes in the females, the one of our women, we all of women in our uh, cells, the, the 23rd actually, or the sex uh, chromosomes are XX, 2X actually we have in it. Why in the male it is X and Y, so answer is A. 32, the color of a mouse fur is controlled by a single pair of alleles. A mouse with black fur was crossed with a mouse with white fur. All the offspring had black fur. What would be the most likely ratio in several liters of, of uh, offspring if two of these black offspring were crossed? I just need to do this one and show it to you. Okay, so let's develop our own pedigree diagram. Uh, the color of a mouse fur is controlled by a single pair of the alias, a mouse with the black fur. So if the mouse has a black fur, I show by the capital B uh, to show that the black having black fur is black is dominant allele. And so is a black fur. And the other one it has a white fur. The other parent has a white fur. I show the white having white color fur by a recessive allele B. All the offsprings have black fur. So all of the offsprings they have black fur. This is very important. All become black, so it means that the parents and this genotype actually combination for the father, for example, or the one of the parents should be BB, it means that it is uh, heterozygous. The other one also should be heterozygous. Sorry, should it, sorry, it should be homozygous recessive. So I just show it like this. So it should be BB. So one of the parents should be this. The other one should be this. Heterozygous, homozygous, recessive. Why? Because this is white color, and I said that the white color, for example, is uh, actually recessive, and having a black color is the dominant color, for example. So uh, B capital is the allele for being black. B is for a recessive color, which is white color. So if both of the recessive appear together at the same time in the genotype, it means that they, that's the time that the color of the fur will be also white. But otherwise, if both are capital, uh, or one is capital, one is uh, small, so it means that the phenotype or the color, final color of the, uh, that individual would be black color. Now, the, we said that all the babies are having black fur. It means that because all of them are uh, recessed, they are uh, heterozygous. How? I developed my punit here to show you why, based on this punit table, we say that this is happening. So this is if I put the allele of this parent here, so it becomes B and B. Okay, the allele for this parent, I show it here. I remove this one to avoid any confusion for you. So, okay, this is not here included. So it is capital B and a small b. Now, this one is nothing. This I should leave, I should leave it empty. And now, this is the first, actually, batch of the 
uh, babies here. I just want to know what is happening here. I put all these offsprings genotypes in this box in between. It means that the parents, they have different alleles. And the, one of the parents has two B, small b, it means all alleles of recessive allele of B in white. And the other parent, it carries one black color allele and the other one white color. Now I want to see what will happen to the babies. This one of the babies can have a combination of this allele and this allele. So I just write it as a capital B, small b. And the other one, I write it here, is for other, other offspring, other baby. And this is for other baby. Sorry, I did a mistake here. Yeah, so this one should be capital. This one was capital. So I think this two should be capital. I did a mistake. It should be capital. Because if I do that, then one of the babies will be white color, but because all the babies are uh, black color, so that the father should also be capital and be capital, homozygous, <coughs> homozygous dominant. So now let's see. Uh, now the baby here becomes capital B again, B. So again black color, again black color. But if I put a uh, small B. It changes a whole story that the babies of the first generation of spring, they won't have all black fur. So now the phenotype of this one is black because the B is uh, dominant. This one, the phenotype is black. Again, black, black. It means 100% of the offsprings are having a black fur. 100%. Okay. This is the first generation. Now, in the, in, the, in the next part of the question, it says, what would be the most likely ratio in several relatives of the spring if two of these black offspring were crossed? If I take two of these offspring and cross them together, what will happen? This is the question. So I can develop another punit diagram here. So I put the alleles of this one as a new parent now. Now the parent this time becomes BB, B capital is small. So it's a heterozygous again. And this are, uh, I just placed the alleles here inside here as another parent. One of them can be female, the another one can be male. Okay. Now I now construct this table. The first baby will be BB. Sorry, both capital again. So this one becomes BB. Capital is small, the other one becomes capital again, sorry, is small, and the other one becomes both small. So, what is happening now? The phenotype of H now. This baby is uh, both B capital. It means that uh, the color of it should be black. I just write B uh, as a black color to show black color. And the phenotype of the next one also is black. But it is heterozygous, but black. This is also black color. But this one is white color because both of them are recessive. So here the white color can show itself in this baby. So if I want to write the ratio of black and white, black, ratio of black to white color, it is equal to how many black do we have? Three. How many white do we have? One. This is the ratio. The probability of having a white child, white fur child, like this one, is one over four. One over four. It means 25%. 25%. Okay? Now I get back to question. 